Hello and good afternoon. I'm ST's foreign editor, Bhagya. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this Connect edition of our ST Connect webinar series. The topic today is Malaysia's politics and economy. Is a reset on the horizon? And we have two guests who will share their views and take your questions. From Kuala Lumpur on Zoom, we have Sharil Hamdan, a key aide of the Malaysian Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob. He's the economic director in the Malaysian Prime Minister's office. He's also AMNO's information chief and the deputy chief of AMNO Youth. And here in the studio with me is ST's Malaysia correspondent, Malaysia Bureau Chief, beg your pardon, Shannon Thio, who is in Singapore for a few days. Hi. Now, before we begin, I want to thank all of you in the audience who have emailed us your questions in advance. And you can still send us your questions through Zoom's Q&A function. And actually, that is the point of the ST Connect webinar series. Our subscribers can ask questions of our correspondents and of the newsmaker. And I promise you, we will get to the top question on many minds today. When is Malaysia going to hold its general election? But before that, and to set the stage for today's discussion, we have a short presentation by Shannon, who will tell us what does Malaysia's political and economic landscape look like today? So over to you, Shannon. Thanks, Bagya. Um, can I get my presentation up? Um, so we're going to be talking about whether uh, we, Malaysia should be on the path to reset or recovery. And I've got a subtitle there. I'm a bit of a naughty journalist. I'm stirring things up. But uh, I just had to take the poultry team. Um, but it really does tie in to the topic at hand, which is part of it is that it's the food supply chain is a very important issue right now in uh, Malaysia's political economy. Um, but that on also just the, the political economy, uh, it's also only one part of the decision making matrix, right? There, there are many different uh, issues at hand for us. Um, and of course, the issue at hand is this decision about whether we should hit the political reset button ASAP and give a new administration a new five-year mandate to roll out all the necessary programs, or whether Malaysia is already on the road to recovery. And so we shouldn't try to derail the process. We shouldn't um, you know, mess up with what's really uh, going on and is proceeding fine. So that's the first question we have. So that's your chicken and egg question. That's the chicken and egg question, whether to do it now or to do it later, right? Which comes first? Um, so the first question is whether is the economy already recovering? And if it is already recovering, we shouldn't disturb it, right? Um, if we look at the next slide, um, if you look, since we started with the chicken and egg, let's talk about inflation first, right? If you look at the past decade, historically, um, we aren't too doing too badly in terms of overall inflation right now. Historically, it's been tracking about 1.9%. Uh, last month, it was 2.8%. It's roughly around 3% this year. It's not too bad if you compare it with uh, regional peers, if you compare it with um, the rest of the world, given global shocks like the Ukraine situation. So that's pretty decent. But if you look at full, full inflation, now that's tracking near historical highs. It's about 5 odd percent. Uh, it has been persistent and it's been even uh, higher for major staples like poultry, dairy and vegetables. Those are tracking about double digits. So overall, um, one thing keeping inflation down lower than regional peers, lower than the rest of the world, is that the government is putting out a lot of subsidies. And if we look at the producer price index, that's been doing over double digits for over a year now. And the last three months was over 11%. So Basically, where we are going with is that the cost of making things is a lot higher than the cost of buying things. So that's where the government subsidies are, are coming in, right? A lot of the subsidies are helping uh, consumers buy cheaper than what they should be paying based on what the purchasers or what the producers uh, are, are getting for their input costs. So will it be enough? If you look at the fiscal space, if you look at the bottom left graph, uh, you can kind of see Malaysia's government deficit growing. Now, this is in absolute terms, of course. This is in millions of ringgit, um, and meaning that the deficit is getting larger. Now, most people will say, but you should be measuring it as a proportion of GDP. Look at the top left now. Malaysia's GDP shrank in 2020. I think a lot, uh, many parts of the world, it shrank because of the pandemic. And in 2021, it didn't really recover as well as uh, you know, some of our peers. And the economy, I think, is right now only 
coming back to just about the 2019 levels. So even in terms of GDP, the deficit is growing larger. We are spending more. In terms of an annual basis, on 2020, the deficit was 6.2. It got deeper in 2021, 6.4. And this year, we are still trying to keep it to 6%. Now, this, this will, will, it's kind of a, a, a feedback loop, right? The deficit will decide how much subsidies you can put out, but how much subsidies you can put out also will affect the deficit. So um, one thing that can keep the deficit down, of course, if it's the, if the economy grows very quickly. And um, right now, we're looking at 5.3 to 6.3 for Malaysia. If you, again, look at that graph, uh, look at the chart, and you compare the regional neighbours, um, a lot of them are doing better than Malaysia. The one country we are, Malaysia is doing better than is Thailand. Um, but this is, of course, Thailand, which um, tourism hasn't really been factored in yet. It's going to come back in um, maybe second quarter. So we have to look at these figures as we go forward, right? Uh, if it's, if it's going to come back up, and then we can kind of see how well Malaysia is doing versus the regional uh, uh, neighbours. And that really will give you a pointer over whether the economy is actually recovering. So is Malaysia on the road to recovery? If you ask me, um, I would kind of use an analogy that, you know, it maybe it hasn't gotten on the highway yet. Maybe it's still on the B road, trying to get on the expressway and trying to tap its touch and go and trying to get through onto the highway. Um, the next question that we have, um, is whether the Isma government can hold. Now, we've been talking about um, you know, government instability, uh, the fragility of the slim majority. So, um, some, some, and and if, if a government get, starts getting wobbly, will uh, recovery policies start getting a bit more nationalistic? You know, some economists are already pointing to things which might be counterproductive, such as the Bumiputra equity safety net we had last year. That was eventually softened. And now there's an ongoing you know, chicken export ban. So these are uh, some key watch points. Uh, maybe if I can get the next slide. So one of the uh, sources of noise, as it were, is that Prikata Nasional, one of uh, Ismail's key alli allies, appears to be slowly imploding. Uh, it is the largest bloc in government, uh, but it's lost more than 10% of its MPs since the turn of the year. There's also the internal AMNO intrigue, I think Shara is pretty well versed on this. Um, it's, it is kind of the source of it is that for the first time in Malaysian history, the Prime Minister is not the party chief, right? So we've got two different kind of uh, um, um, points of gravity in AMNO right now. Uh, most recently, the President Zaid Hamidi, he sacked the Supreme Council member, who then proceeded to make uh, several allegations of, of certain conspiracies going on within the party. I think Sharil has commented on this, urging the party not to get bogged down by the past, uh, but to focus on winning GE15 and to present a united front. I just want to add here that Sharil himself is at a very unique point of intersection. Uh, he is the AMNO information chief, so he's in charge of ensuring the party's messaging comes across loud and clear, but he's also the PM's economic director, which, you know, given what we've discussed in the previous section, that's a mammoth task you know, to get the economy back on track uh, post-pandemic. But nonetheless, you know, if we ask questions about whether AMNO and Barisa National can present a united front, what we do know is the opposition definitely does not have a united front. If anything, they're in, the wor in worse shape, right? From Anwar Ibrahim's uh, Pakatan Harapan to Muhyiddin Yassin's Prakatan National, seemingly endless number of independent parties out there. They just can't seem to put their egos aside and come to any sort of compromise. So this plays into Barisan National's hands, right? As the most established party, uh, it's ruled for six decades. It's got, a hard, it's got the largest hardcore vote bank. And a split between opponents usually guarantees that it's, it's going to come up uh, tops at the next general election. But, um, and our third and last question that, that I, I want to present for discussion is that, um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Would we really get a reset after the next election? Now, you see uh, some messy maps in front of you. These are the maps of Johor and Malacca, uh, the two most recent state elections, um, which BN won very handsomely. It won by more than two-thirds majority. But if you look, if you drill down into the numbers, um, you'll find that BN won a lot of the seats. But in Malacca, for example, it won 38% of the vote out of a 66% turnout. And in Johor, it won 43% of the vote out of a 55% turnout, that's even lower, right? Um, so in a normal general election, 
you would get historically, right, from 2008, the turnout was 76%, then 85% and 82%. So that's a lot of voters which probably didn't bother to turn out. Now, if you assume that they will turn out for the, for the, the general election, the big election, right, mm. uh, then there's millions of voters that still not accounted for. Part of this is because of this new uh, reform called Undi Lapan Blast, right? You get something like 37% more voters, young voters, automatically registered voters. If there's a party out there that can excite them, uh, that party is probably uh, you know, going to be in very good shape. It's going to really r increase its, its vote share. So there are millions of votes out there uh, for the taking. Now, I, I mean, I don't get too deep into all the electoral mathematics of it, but it's just putting out there that you know, um, maybe BN shouldn't count their chickens before they hatch. I'm sorry to use the chicken team again, but um, and it may boil down to um, if you if you come to it after the general election that no one has a simple majority, and that you will still need to build a government of two or more coalitions, and that brings us back to where we are today: is a government of two or more uh, coalitions. But and if just coming to my last slide, uh, and would this be a new normal for Malaysia? You know, Malaysians have by and large gotten on with life despite all the remarks about a backdoor government, the use or some people say abuse of an emergency, uh, and, and having a prime minister now who is not a party chief. But maybe all this is just a lot of noise, a lot of talk about fragility, because this is not a government that was elected during an, during an election. Even if it was two coalitions that were properly elected during an election, I think Malaysians would accept that. Even if we had a grand coalition, or a minority government with a, a confidence and supply agreement, uh, I don't think it would be uh, unacceptable to people if it was not the result of defections and things like that, but if it was decided at the ballot. Uh, one thing that's happening right now, and maybe it's coming under the radar a bit, is this anti-hopping law that um, we are trying to put in place to make sure that people, well, it's a deterrent to, to defections, right? Uh, and that would be pretty crucial to stability. Because even if you have a slim majority or even a minority government, your government should be pretty solid because of this law, right? that you're not going to lose numbers overnight because someone is just unhappy. So um, this anti hopping law, I think, would, is kind of underestimated in importance in terms of pursuing stability. If stability is uh, the, the, the key factor for us to move forward, then I think this law is going to be very important. So that's what I have. I mean, this is just up for discussion. I don't have the answers, not yet at least, and maybe after Having Sharil on, you'll get a bit more answers. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I have, Bagya. Okay, thank you, Shannon. That was a great presentation. Um, so let's get the ball rolling. I have a question first for Sharil. Uh, Prime Minister Ismail Sabri is soon going to complete his first year in office. Could you tell us, sitting at the Prime Minister's office and being the economic director, could you tell us what are his key accomplishments this year? Sure. Uh, thanks, Bagia. Um, hi, uh, Shannon. And thanks, everyone, everyone at ST for, for hosting this and uh, having me on. Uh, so, first question, what are his key achievements given that he's coming up to uh, a year? Um, I think um, many understate his achievement in office. One of the first things he did uh, was to make clear that lockdowns were, as far as possible, a thing of the past. Uh, he was absolutely clear um, from the very beginning uh, that he wanted the economy to open up. And that, uh, that kind of uh, firmness and consistency, I think, has paid off, uh, at least in top-line figures. We've had uh, employment figures, um, you know, uh, recovering to pre, pre-COVID levels almost. Um, FDI, better than pre-COVID. Uh, we've had two quarters of uh, over 24 billion ringgit in uh, foreign direct investment uh, quarter 4, 2021, quarter 1, 2022, which are the latest figures, uh, were uh, best ever figures. You, know, you could argue that we started from a low base, a lot of the investments were delayed, but still, uh, it's, uh, I think it's to his credit that during his watch, uh, people uh, and, and, and investors decided to deploy uh, and decide to deploy uh, record uh, amounts of or record figures of, of investments. Um, whether or not uh, these things will follow through, that's the challenge next time uh, or moving forward. But those figures are as they are you know, because of the kind of uh, consistency and I think clarity of, um, of the economy opening up. 
uh, GDP growth has also been, you know, despite Shannon's uh, um, correct figures about how it didn't do so well in 2021, um, I think in in, uh, in the time that he's been in office, uh, GDP growth has uh, recorded a figure that uh, will also, I think, uh, impress uh, in the in the next report. Thank you. Uh, Shannon, what do you think, especially the foreign direct investment? Uh, do you concur with Sharil? And do you think these are issues that voters are going to most likely mm. care about? Well, I think with, with investments, to answer it backwards, uh, you always see the effect later on, right? There's a bit of a lag. They have to plant up, they have to get, you know, they have to hire people and, and get the jobs out there. So these are very notable achievements. I mean, I have been trying to ask investors, how did we go from, you know, what some people were, what critics were calling Malaysia, you know, sick man of ASEAN, because in 2020, I think, the, the investment figures were very low. And all of a sudden, we've rebounded and, and everyone's coming back in. And I, I guess Sharia might have a point there, you know, somehow this administration has managed to excite investors again. But again, um, on the ground for, for, for the lay person, the, 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 the working professional out there, he's not going to see those jobs yet, right? Um, these are approved investments, if I'm not wrong, they're approved of investments. Um, and it will take a while before they do come in. But it is a good signal. And I think if, you're, if, if you are uh, in the administration right now, you want to keep this momentum going uh, because then also the investors who are already in kind of see this, this growth story, right? And they're going to start thinking that, hey, there are going to be more opportunities in Malaysia. Some investors previously might be thinking about, maybe I'm going to start, uh, um, you know, um, uh, um, rationalizing my operations in Malaysia, but maybe they, are, they might change their minds now. And for the investors who are already here, they can, the, the impact can be pretty immediate. So this could be a storyline that could be, uh, have an impact uh, if there is time for, for it to take effect. I mean, but that's something we're talking about now, right? How much time is, exactly. is, is, is there? You know? so exactly. And that actually is my next question. Uh, so all things considered, you have seen Sh uh, Shannon's presentation. Um, well, what do you think? When is Malaysia going to go in for a general election? You've told us good things about the economy that are happening in, it, in the Prime Minister's first year. Uh, so to make the answer a bit easier for you, I have four options for you. So option A, election within the next three months, that is before the budget. Option B, within the next six months, that is soon after the budget. Option C, early next year. And option D, just before elections falls due anyway in September 2023. So usually when you have a multiple choice question, uh, that helps. But this is one of those situations where you flock me in to pick one. Right? <laughs> Um, so I suppose um, it's more of me saying what I think, what I think uh, is is best and is likely to happen. Um, if given those four options, uh, my personal opinion, and you know I've said this not so publicly, but you know within within um, external audience, uh, my view is that uh, there's a sweet spot uh, for when uh, elections ought to happen. Uh, politically speaking, you want to do it before your opponents um, perhaps solidify more than uh, they are at this point. Uh, just as Shannon said, um, you know, uh, for all the questions around UMNO solidity and unity, uh, things are probably quite a bit worse on uh, on the other side. Uh, not that we take necessarily pleasure from it, but that's just the way it is. And, and I guess the timing has to take into account uh, whether uh, waiting too long will uh, will run the risk of them actually fixing that particular issue. So for that reason, as well as perhaps the more important reason, which is I think uh, the economy requires some firm and brave decisions. Firm and brave decisions that may not be uh, too popular. You know, you could talk about more targeted subsidies, you could talk about more uh, steps towards systemic change and structural uh, transformation, some of which we can speak about uh, later. All of this will require a mandate, a strong mandate, uh, and, and definitely a prime minister who can claim uh, to have his own mandate. For those couple of reasons, if I had to pick, and this is you know, to be clear, a personal view, and not because I am in Amno's office or in the PM's office that I have some particular insight, 
personally, if I had to pick, uh, my my sense is that the uh, the sweet spot is probably somewhere around B. Somewhere around B, which is after the budget, within which is within months. six months. No, no, I'm within going to use your months. words, which is okay. within six months, which could well within be within three months. months. So you know, A All is right. a subset of B, okay, right? That's so I'm a... picking. Right, right. That's a very, very good interpretation. So what about you, Shannon? Do you agree? Do you? How do you see this playing out? Well, I think um, the one very strong point that everyone is looking at is, uh, is that the, the, for UMNO, for Barisan Nationalists, the opponents are so divided, they are, they are in a mess. If you do it any time this year, uh, whether in the next three or six months, as, as Charles mentioned, um, you are going to definitely face uh, opponents who are in disarray. Right, that's that's your advantage, but how sweet is the ground right now? Right, I mean, um, people will point to the fact that oh, you know, I'm not still won the most number of votes in Malacca, in Johor, so on and so forth. But as I, we were discussing it for for a short while, the the electoral arithmetic is 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 not so straightforward, right? Um, I do think that for the prime minister, it's just again, my view is not because. I've got even, I'm even further from the Prime Minister's office than Sharia, obviously. Um, it's not that I have any special insight into what Ismail Sabri is thinking. But I do feel that um, waiting until next year would suit him. Him being the Prime Minister. Him uh, be, being the Prime Minister. Mm. Um, for both political and for economic reasons. Uh, on the one hand, um, I don't think uh, in the sense uh, but I think Barisan National has already started preparing for elections. They've ro started rolling out programs all around the country. Um, but internally, uh, what has been the decision making in terms of uh, the various uh, different factions, the ver various different camps? Have they sorted out their own house? I think that's one thing that, for what, what it respect, regardless of what's happening on the other side, mm -hmm. for BN that's very important. Historically, BN has always talked about making sure there's no internal sabotage. Mm -hmm. Once there is no internal sabotage, BN presents a very strong uh, option for voters. As long as the local warlords on the ground are not fighting with each other, trying to say you shouldn't vote for these guys and so forth, it, they, they pr present a very strong vote bank, right? Once, once their, their grassroots are together. So I think that's one of the things that uh, the Prime Minister might also be looking at. Um, they now, Amno now has a new structure called the Top 5. Uh, which is separate from the Supreme Council. And, and, and so the, 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 that's, uh, it, it's unique, it, that's something new, right? Uh, where the, the top guns, as it were, uh, are sitting down to discuss, to duke out this, this, this kind of uh, uh, issues. Um, I also think that um, there are two views with regards to inflation. One view is that it's going to keep going on and on and on because this Ukraine crisis is not going to sort itself out in the next three months. But if you're tracking commodity prices closely, they seem to have come off a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some kind of promise, maybe, just hope I don't jinx it, mm -hmm. that, the, that the worst is over. Mm -hmm. And so then you might want to wait for a while for, for these inflationary pressures to taper off and then maybe call an election there. And that might take some time. Uh, again, I don't know if it's going to be in the next six months or mm -hmm. not, but you might want to wait for that. So um, I won't bet my house on it. But I would say, I think early next year is, 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 is a, would be a good call. So there you go, two answers there, from Sharil within six months and from Shannon, it's early, early next year. Early 2023, yeah. Early 2023, okay. So stay tuned. And I do want to call out to our audience that if you have a question, we are very happy to take it. And you can send it in using the Q&A function on your Zoom. Uh, okay, so you talked about the big guns, Shannon. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that brings to mind, you know, all that we've been reading thanks to your reports and, and you know, the Abiro reports about all that's happening within UMNO. Uh, Sharil himself made a pitch for UMNO unity. I think that was just last week. Yes. So, um, so Sharil, perhaps I should ask you first, why did you feel the need to make that pitch? Why did you call for UMNO unity just last week? Yeah, I think uh, Shannon helped me with that. Uh, answer already just now when he says that uh, Amno strength uh, are very is very Amno has some blind spots and weaknesses, but all things remaining equal, uh, a unified Amno is probably strong favorites for the next election. 
uh, if we were to uh, throw away that um, asset, if we were to throw away that strength uh, that we have, that differentiating factor, uh, and give in to internal sabotage and internal intrigue that is played out in the public, um, I think uh, we would be shooting ourselves in the foot. And, and you know, to complete my answer, we've seen in Malacca, we've seen in Johor, whatever internal tensions that people might speculate would have existed then as well. But uh, what we managed to do in those two state elections and the previous by-elections were to put those things aside and sort of uh, postpone that conversation, postpone that uh, you know open debate about uh, difficult questions to after we win an election. And I think uh, one of the key party decisions that we made is that the party elections ought to happen after the G. Now, when the party elections happen, I think we'll have some soul searching to do, especially depending on how the results go. Uh, and even if we win, there will be some tough questions to be to be asked. But uh, I think the public now is waiting uh, and needing a strong government, a stable politics. Uh, they they want to see an UMNO that is. Uh, not riddled with internal divisions. Uh, and if we, we do deliver or we do get a majority or lead the next government with our own mandate, then that is the right time uh, to, if there's any need to speak uh, openly or to uh, critique openly any particular thing about our uh, party dynamic, but not before. Right. Uh, so, Shannon, I see this disruption in some Malaysian media. I don't think we've used it. But they're calling it a civil war within UMNO. How do you react to that? Is, is well, that... I, I did use the, uh, one of these viral memes in, in my presentation, this picture of Zahir and Ismail Sabri on the other side. But um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they do meet pretty often, or at least representatives from, from the government and representatives from the party. They do meet very often. Um, and to talk about um, not just... a issues of politics, but also issues of government policy. So I think there is room for them to, to, to compromise, to come to some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, ceasefire as you will. When I use the word ceasefire, it seems like, you know, it's all out war in the party. Yeah, the mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's, I think the right word to always use is, is intrigue, right? And we're talking about politicians. Politicians are always ambitious. Everyone was trying to, to jockey for, for, for better position for a better uh, outcome for themselves, uh, especially ahead of an election. But I think that's what's going on now. If you were the Prime Minister, obviously, foremost in your mind is, I want to continue being <laughs> Prime Minister, right, after this. And, and I think, of course, the party has, has issued a statement, uh, I think back in April, saying that Ismail Sabri will be our candidate for it. But if you, look, if you listen to the chatter, uh, what people are saying is that, well, you know, we, we, yes, we want to do that, but, you know, after the election, depending on how the numbers go, that, you know, we, your hands might be tied. You know, that a lot of things can change with the, with the political dynamics. Um, so, I think that um, there, so I mean, that's why I also think that for, if, if for the Prime Minister, uh, in the next three, six months, it's going to be tough for him to kind of tie up all these loose ends internally in the party as well. Um, there are going to have to be deals that are going to be made. And I'm, and I'm not suggesting anything nefarious. Deals are always made in political parties, especially coming up to an election, so on and so forth. Uh, and you have to appease a lot of different uh, 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 in interests and different groups before you can say, all right, my party, my coalition is united. I think we're going to do well. Right. Uh, we do have a question from the audience at this point. It's on the economy. Uh, so the question is from Ms. Jolly He. Uh, she wants to know, what is Malaysia's value proposition compared to its neighbours in terms of attracting investors and tourists? So, Sharil, would you have some thoughts on this? Sure. Uh, shifting gears to, uh, to more uh, equally difficult questions by a different team. Sighing, breathing a sigh of relief. Um, so when it comes to, I suppose, uh, what's our value prop? Uh, this is one of the most foundational questions that Malaysia faces uh, and has to answer decisively in the next couple of years. Uh, for me, for me, it's not what it is right now. Uh, it should be what we aspire to, 
to do and to be able to say is our value proposition in say two to three years. Uh, and I rather answer it that way so that we can think aspirationally. <coughs> uh, for me, uh, number one is um, we should uh, say our value proposition is uh, superior infrastructure, uh, a superior climate for businesses uh, akin to Singapore, even if we can't match Singapore uh, to a T, but very close to it. Um, and, I, and there needs to be things that are fixed so that we can say that with confidence, but I think it's doable. Uh, I think our value proposition ought to also be our talent. Again, a lot of work needs to be done there, but I think in two to three years, if we do it properly, uh, we could do it. Uh, so local talent that can fix or sorry, can uh, offer uh, investors the kind of uh, high quality labor workforce that they want. At the same time, a more expat-friendly uh, environment or climate uh, where Malaysian talent cannot fill those positions in the interim, uh, we'd like to, again, if not entirely match Singapore, but be a, you know, a real alternative. Right. There are other more uh, tricky questions about how we uh, also leverage off Singapore leverage of Kalimantan uh, with Indonesia's uh, new uh, shift uh, to have their administrative center in Borneo. Those are the things that I think uh, we ought to have uh, clarity on or ought to have uh, distinctive propositions on. Rather than see Singapore as a threat, rather than see as Indonesia as a threat, really kind of complement uh, those two you know, uh, neighbors uh, to become a real investor-friendly and investor-friendly destination for this region. That's the kind of aspiration I see Malaysia uh, positioning itself in. So work around talent is key because some of the feedback we're getting from investors is that uh, talent is an issue. Uh, also, uh, getting uh, high quality or uh, highly paid uh, expats to live in Malaysia is an issue, but I think those are things that can be fixed quite quickly. Um, we also see that there is uh, uh, um, sort of uh, indecision about how we treat Singapore and how we treat Indonesia. In my mind, as you can see from my answer, I think we should treat them uh, friendly and see them as opportunity uh, uh, channels as opposed to necessarily an adversarial or com overly competitive uh, uh, kind of view so that we, we get to a win-win situation. On the tourism side, uh, in my mind, Malaysia suffers from uh, recently a lack of packaging and marketing in a way that fulfills our potential. We have so many uh, interesting, and attractive tourist sites, uh, but somehow the, I think the packaging and the marketing so that uh, tourists understand uh, the slew of offerings and attractions uh, that exist in this country. Um, better understand and therefore, you know, sort of uh, uh, see Malaysia as a true, truly uh, attractive destination. I think we've missed out on that since our Malaysia Truly Asia thing, maybe about a decade, a decade and a half ago. That, that really worked for a while. Uh, since then, I think other countries have managed to uh, market their destinations quite a bit better than us. So I think it's not so much of our actual uh, attractions, but how we uh, how we market them to uh, to tourists and to different and new uh, sections of the international community who are now seeing Southeast Asia as not just an investment destination but a holiday destination. Right. And another question on the economy from Mr. Peter Khan, who is asking, uh, will the government consider pegging the ring ringgit to the US dollar or the euro or the Chinese yuan in order to control inflation, stabilize the economy better? Uh, so monetary policy is a, is a uh, complex one in Malaysia because Bank Negara has uh, quite a bit of independence on this. But I think from, from what I understand uh, from within government, there's very little appetite to be doing that. Uh, you know, you could go through the academic arguments uh, as to why and even empirical arguments as to why pegging uh, runs uh, with it. Uh, various other risks uh, that uh, that we don't want to run into. So we are a trading nation. Uh, we 40% uh, of our workforce is in uh, export-oriented sectors. 
uh, while a uh, steep depreciation of the ringgit is not something we welcome, but uh, depreciation and uh, of in and of itself uh, does have some winners from within the country. So as long as I think the stability of the ringgit can be maintained and it's kind of come back a bit this last couple of weeks, uh, and I think uh, we're not overly obsessed about the particulars uh, in terms of the actual exchange given time. Um, Shan, can I ask you, what about the ringgit and the sing dollar? Mm -hmm. Any observations on that and how it might trend out? What, what do you see? Well, um, this question, by the way, is also from one of the audience, from Miss Han Soon Lang. The, well, I mean, we, we've seen the, the sing dollar strengthening. I mean, it's been a, a long-running story, right? The sing dollar always strengthens against the ringgit by a factor about uh, 1 or 2 percent every year. Uh, and I think w what alarms people is when it, it goes off that trajectory. Mm -hmm. It's nearly a kind of inbuilt expectation. Yeah, every year, you know, the Sing dollar will be worth a few few more cents. But if you compare, I think maybe this time last year and, uh, and this time today, um, it was maybe about 3.04, 3.05, and then now it's 3.17. And I think a couple of weeks back, it, it, it bro breached uh, 3.2. So I mean, like, these are record highs, right? Um, and I think kind of automatically Malaysians always think of the of their own financial health in terms of how much is the ringgit worth in, in terms of Singapore dollars or US dollars. If it gets smaller, they say, oh, now my salary is smaller than it used to be. You know, there's always that, that kind of argument. I think that has to be read also together with how have wages moved in Malaysia. And you do get a lot of complaints in Malaysia about how, uh, especially for fresh grads, for those who are early career, it's not moved high enough, right? Like inflation has beaten the, the rise of, uh, you know, the basic salaries. Um, I think as you move up the, the career path, it, it gets a bit better. But I think that's one thing also that, that maybe, if we, you know, the, this conversation about talent that, that Sharil had brought up. Um, a lot of people, I think if you, if you go around Malaysia, it, if they had studied overseas or something, and you ask them, would you come back to work in Malaysia? I don't think it would be their first option because they look at the starting salaries and maybe they think, I want to start my career somewhere. I can come back to Malaysia later, maybe mid-level, mm -hmm. right? And then the salaries then are, are not too bad. So um, this is something that is, is a, it is also a very complex conversation. I think we recently raised our minimum wage and that took a few months, a lot of consultation. There was a lot of back and forth. Some of the SMEs didn't like it. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of necessary. If you look at the minimum wage that we have now, um, I personally don't think it's high enough. Uh, it could use a, a maybe five, ten percent points uh, a bit higher than what it is right now. Right. Uh, and back to politics. Uh, here's a question. I think it's both for Sharil and Shannon. It's an important question too. Uh, how likely is it that the young voters, you know, those who are 18 and above and voting for the first time when the GE happens, how likely is it that they will be able to change the way of politics in Malaysia? Uh, you know, whether specifically. Uh, Lim Tse Wee is asking us, uh, asking both of you, whether specifically the young voters can overturn this race-based politics that is uh, in Malaysia. So, Sharil. Um, so, this question would have been asked 10 years ago. It would have been asked 20 years ago, and we're still here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not necessarily saying the answer is no. Um, I think uh, how race-based politics has been played out in this country has changed. Uh, and it's sometimes two steps forward, one step back. But it, I think if we're honest about it, the way we talk about uh, racial politics um, right now in 2022, is not the same as how we maybe did in, I don't know, 1980s or even in 1990s. Um, so there is an evolution. Uh, of the kind of language that is used. There is an evolution of the reaction uh, within the public when certain uh, old facets of the racialized or sometimes racist language is, is used by the political class, uh, which informs the evolution I talk about. So that's a long-winded way of saying racial politics is still existent um, in Malaysia. But uh, I don't think it's done in the necessarily the same kind of zero-sum uh, way that perhaps uh, people sometimes simplify it as. 
and and young voters have a lot to do with that even if they themselves uh, still uh, subscribe some parts of them at least large segments of them still subscribe to to kind of uh, ethno uh, political identities but identity politics is still very strong in Malaysia, May, maybe even stronger than it used to be. And, and of course, a, a strong element of identity politics is, uh, in Malaysia at least, religion and, and also ethnic identifiers, right? Um, uh, that's still very strong. And I, and I mean, recent surveys have, have borne that out, especially among young Malaysians, it, it, it is still very strong. But how does it translate into uh, how they interact with politics? Well, in the first place, Political apathy is also very high among among youth. Um, so if you take the two things together, I don't think they necessarily think of the 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 race and religion question in the same breath as the political question. I don't think those two are an automatic kind of step for them. And maybe it used to be, and, and Malaysians used to always think or look towards the government to protect my so and so religious interest, my so and so racial interest. And I think that's decoupled a bit. Uh, and there is a less of a sense of looking to the government always. You must protect my whatever place of worship or you must protect my vernacular education. So I think there is a stepping away from that. I identify as so and so uh, um, of, 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 of whatever ethnic descent or, or religious, but we've got to you know, figure it out for ourselves, right? And so then the question to politicians and to policymakers is not so much how you are going to play into the question, but your role is just to govern, right? To make sure that the right policies are out there. And then for it, I mean, it nearly in a sense, uh, there are some, of course, um, um, hot topics that will come up from, from time to time. I think when Pakatan Harapan was in power, out of nowhere, this Jawi issue popped up. And it, it, it's from a simple script, it became a Malay versus Chinese right. kind of thing, right? And it just spiraled out of control. But actually, when you look at the heart, at the heart of it, was people being upset because of other things, and it just kind of uh, channeled. Uh, uh, found it, was the, it became a lightning rod for all those other insecurities and, and unhappiness, right? Um, I think what the, what any government going up into the next election should be or should be campaigning about, not just f in the interest of the country, but even in the interest of their own party. It's about what you can promise people e economically, right? I think that's that's a very key question people are asking, especially after the pandemic, so on and so forth. You, you looked at how so, so many households have suffered. I think that's the first question that, that will be on their minds. It's not so much how is the government going to protect my ethnic interests, but how is the government going to protect my kind of my livelihood, my financial situation. Mm. Um, another popular question from the audience, this is coming from a couple of people, uh, but this one very direct and uh, perhaps Sharil, if you could take this, will former PM Najib, <laughs> Najib Tun Razak be PM again? Um, I, I think, you know, the, it's clear that our PM candidate is Ismail Sabri. Uh, that's something that has been repeated um, by the party leadership time and again. So that's really what we are focusing on. And um, I'd rather, you know, not speculate about how other people might uh, be or not be PM because that will run against what has been clearly said and even affirmed again by the deputy president, I think two days ago or a day ago from in Sabah, uh, where he said, look, uh, you know, don't entertain speculations and, and viral WhatsApp messages uh, that are trying to cast out uh, about the party decision that he is the PM candidate. So if Amno wins and Amno uh, becomes prime minister, uh, you know it's absolutely clear within the leadership uh, that the person who will be PM is the current PM. But what's next for Najib? That's another question because, uh, as we know, his appeal is coming up next month, right? So uh, what's next for him? What could be a trajectory for him? There, there is a lot of curiosity about him. I, although your question, your Points are entirely fair, Sharif, but there is this curiosity, if you could tell us. Well, I think the, the, the court process is ongoing. Uh, the, the, the prosecution is very, making very strong arguments uh, about uh, Najib's, uh, what, what you might call it, strategy or tactics. Uh, they don't think that he needs this uh, Queen's Council from, from the UK and things like that. 
um, it does appear that we are going to get some finality maybe by the end of this year, for at least for that one conviction that he has. Of course, he's got all the other cases that they are going on. But I mean, nonetheless, uh, uh, political leaders have been jailed before. They've been convicted before. They've come back later on. So I don't, maybe post-GE15 uh, is, is not the time for Najib to make a comeback, if at all. Uh, but if he does, you know, there, there are future general elections. If it takes him 15, 20 years, he won't be Malaysia's oldest ever prime minister if that happens, yes, <laughs> right? Indeed. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, never say never, right? But I think in the kind of a short term, um, I think his influence is very useful for Amno, but I don't think that uh, it, it, it would be wise for himself or the party to seriously entertain this idea of him becoming uh, the prime minister again in, in such a short space of time. Okay, so in no time at all, we come to nearly the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, but very quick question uh, for you, Sharil. What is Malaysia's property uh, outlook looking like? Uh, you know, it, it, there is some observation that, you know, it's um, the, the, on the supplier side, it's a bit more. So what does it look like, uh, especially in Johor? So this, this is a, uh, a question from the audience as well, from Ms. Chu. In what is Johor property looking like? Yeah, I have to. I have to. I have to pass on this one. Um, this is not something I um, necessarily sure. am. We are well versed in. Um, sure. My, as as you know, as somebody who's a bit younger, my my sense is you know um, what's most important uh, is uh, figuring out how we increase incomes of people, so salaries, uh, wages, and that relates to the ability of business to get on a property ladder, um, right. and. For as long as our wages are suppressed, for as long as our incomes are relatively low, um, any push towards getting more Malaysians onto the property ladder uh, will lead to increased household uh, debt to GDP, uh, which is the worrying figure. Not so much government debt to GDP in my mind. Singapore has, a, you know, if I'm not wrong, over 100% or close to 100% government uh, fiscal debt to GDP ratio. Uh, but nobody worries about that, partly because it's Singapore, sure, but also because you manage your household that um, figures quite a bit better than, than we do. We are at 90%. Uh, so that's uh, that's really in as much as, um, uh, you know, uh, property is concerned with me. I'm always looking at it in the view or from the lens of how it contributes towards household debt. Um, and, and it's a key function or a key part of uh, that driver, which... Uh, which uh, which is something we need to address. But in terms of the, the you know, in terms of the property market, I think you've got to, you've got to ask somebody else who's a bit more. Uh, sure, you. thank you. If you could just, in 30 seconds, tell me what the property outlook is like. I know it's a... Well, it yeah. was, there was a, I mean, just very quickly, there was an overhang before the pandemic. Uh -huh. I doubt that during the pandemic, people were going out there and buying new houses, uh, lock, stock and barrel. But on the other hand, then supply kind of was on pause, right, during the pandemic as well. So I think where we are right now is that the overhang is still there, but it's given time for the supply side to kind of think about whether it can rebalance itself. What are your offerings? It was obviously not matching the market, right? And so I think you take a mix of both the private sector and the public sector to think about, do we want to keep playing this game of chicken where we are going to supply this and it's up to the consumer. If you don't want it, then they have no house. Or are you going to properly fix this problem? Because one of the key sources of domestic uh, direct investment was in real estate sector and that's been shrinking because um, the people who are making the homes have realised that I can't sell. So they, they stopped investing. And that's why that DDI figure has been dropping. So it's an important thing, uh, not just for the industry themselves to fix, but also at the policymaker stage. Right, okay. Thank you. I think we are coming to an end of this webinar. So that was a great discussion and I hope our audience also found it useful. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Sharil. And thank you to our audience as well. You had some great questions. I regret we couldn't get to all of them, but I hope you did enjoy the discussion. A recording of this live discussion is going to be available to you later this evening on ST's website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, and of course, if you'd like to hear more from Shannon, he comes out with a newsletter every Wednesday and uh, that gets delivered to your inbox. So you can sign up for this newsletter on our website. So thank you once again. 
Keep reading The Straits Times and stay well. And goodbye till we meet again. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. And hit the bell icon to be notified of new videos.